my eyes to the hills, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will never, will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over you, your life. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Let us stand as we sing number 470. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for the breath of life. We thank you for the Sabbath day. For we know without a Sabbath, everything will have been chaotic. And we praise your name for that. In this moment, I ask you to please be with your speaker today. Please help him to present your word the way you want him to present it. And I ask you to please bless him and bless his family as he commits himself to serve you. I pray in this moment for the audience, the people who left their homes to come to your house. Like the prayer of Solomon, 
I pray that since they come and they left their homes, that means they're looking for something that only you can provide. I ask you today, dear God, since they have come, please incline your ears and hear them and bless them in a very special way. So we ask you today, please don't forget our Ukraine. Dear God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Please be with us in this moment. Help us to open our hearts to receive your word. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I would like to welcome each and every one of you here. I know for some of us the week was not so great. We maybe had a rough week, but by the grace of God, we're here in this moment, and we praise God for that. And I pray that you get a special blessing today, and I pray that God speak to your hearts today. Okay? Um, the announcement is that um, the Gibbons family would like to thank you so much for the box that you have provided for Uganda. And now it's the time for them to ship those books. And the cost for that is $1,800. And they would like to ask if you would like to participate, please contact Sister Margaret Gibbons at the number provided on this here. Contact Sister Margaret Gibbons at 508-713-8535. That's the first announcement. I have another announcement. Um, it's going to be time for me to um, take some pictures. You know what I do with the pictures. <laughs> so I'm going to start with the men because we know June is coming. I plan on doing something different. Well, I, I will take the men, and if they have their family here, I will take their family too. So it's a double dipping for the families, okay? But I would like to ask you for a favor, mothers, children, Make sure your parents, your, your dad, or your husbands take a picture so that I can have this um, project set and ready to go, okay? As you know, time is of essence, and we love the um, church family. We love our fathers, our men of the church, and we would like, you know, to do it nicely and specially for them, okay? And, and, and the next Sabbath... Um, when the pastor is here, if you would like also, I would like to take some picture with you and your pastor. You know, that will be a sign of embracing our pastor in the church family. Amen? Amen. Amen. I don't know, um, Fawn, if you have any um, announcement. Again, welcome in the house of the Lord today. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Isadora graduated yesterday. Um, Fun sent me pictures. That's a daughter of the church. Please always have a, a, a prayer in your hearts for our graduates, our daughters, our sons of the church. And please pray for the young people of our church. Pray that God gives them a vision on what they're supposed to do and that God orders their steps in his word. We praise the name of the Lord for that because we know this is a prayer church. It's a praying church. And please don't forget our young people. I know Paula is going to graduate soon. So please keep our young people in your prayers. Uh, we thank God for our young people. Amen. Good morning. Um, Jackie had to leave us to visit a sick friend. So she asked me to step in. Um, in the, the hymn that we just sang, number 470, The Sunshine in My Soul Today, there was one of the lines that really uh, struck home to me, and it was in um, the um, fourth verse. It said, for blessings which he gives me now. And doesn't the Lord always bless us, even when we are not aware of it? Um, today's offering emphasis is for the General Conference and the North American Division, and we also know that as Seventh-day Adventists, we have a unique message to send to the world. And it's a message that's based on the Bible. And um, having been a 
former, not only Baptist, but a uh, Protestant who has gone to many, many different Protestant churches as a child with her friends, with her family, and also other ch Christian churches and other non-Christian churches, uh, churches. I can tell you just what a special, uh, special message that we have to share. You know, when I think of our giving, um, two verses in the Bible really leap out to me. I should say two passages. One's a verse and one's a passage. Um, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Matthew 6, verse 1, starts with how we should give. And it says, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what they, thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And boy, does he reward us in so many different ways. And the other verse that comes to mind is from the book of James, um, James um, chapter 1, verse 17. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God never turns from us. We may temporarily turn from him, but he's always looking out for us and our best interests. And that's how we can show our, not, our uh, no variableness with him, that when we return a faithful tithe and our offerings to things like the General Conference and the North American Division, we're also realizing and, and understanding who, who God really is and what he has done for us. It seems such a small gift to return to him. So at this time, I'd like for us, our deacons, to stand and let's bow our head for prayer. Dear Lord, until we see you face to face, we'll never be able to understand just what you have done for each and every one of us in our lives. We thank you for all the good and perfect gifts that you give to us every day of our lives. And we thank you that we can allow you, us to give uh, back and show you our faithfulness that we acknowledge you as our creator and our Lord. So please bless these tithes and offerings as they go to where the need is greatest. We thank you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Although I don't see any really young ones today, those of you that are young or feel young at heart are welcome to join me up front for the children's story. Thank you. Well, good morning. Hope all of you are having a nice Sabbath today. Um, today, I actually have prepared um, to uh, tell you an animal story. In fact, this particular animal is mentioned literally dozens of times in the Bible. These animals are called cattle, and they live all around the world. Now, most of you are kind of grown up, so you probably realize that we don't hear the word cattle too often but um, people tend to refer to the type of cattle. For example, the daddy ones, which are the biggest ones, are called bulls, and then the mother cattle are called cows, and then the babies are called calves. And when I did a little research, I was surprised to find that there are more than a thousand different breeds of cattle on earth. In fact, um, Ms. Gagnon, Mrs. Gagnon probably should be telling this story because she grew up on a cattle farm and she knows a lot more about them than I do. Although I can say that my mother actually worked on a cattle farm summers when she was a little girl, so she taught us a lot about them herself. 
Even in Sterling, we have cattle. I can think of at least five or six different breeds that I see driving around the town. We have the Holsteins, which are the black and white dairy cows. I know there's a herd of Hereford on Route 62. Those are the ones that are brown with a white face. Um, we have Scottish Highland cattle, which have really long fur and very long horns, um, Black Angus, and we even have belted Galloways. They're the ones that I think look like bees. They're black with a white stripe around the middle. Um, my story is actually a true story, and it takes place in a very small little country that's tucked in next to England, and the name of the country is Wales. And Wales is actually only about the size of the state of New Jersey. And in the southern part of Wales, there lived a man by the name of Donald Mottram, and he had a cattle farm. It was actually pretty good size for Wales. It was about 70 acres, and he lived there with his wife and his three sons, and it had lots of fields. And because it was 70 acres, it was a little too hard for him to walk around from place to place, so he actually had a little motorbike, and he would use that to drive from field to field. Now, there were about 40 cows on his farm, and he had a few calves, and there was also a big bull that was staying on the farm. And this bull was special because of two particular reasons. One reason was its breed. Um, this was a Charolai bull, and it's one of the largest types of uh, cattle there are, and it was a breed that was actually developed in France. And if you haven't seen a Charolai, it did to bring a picture. So this is what a Charolai bull would look like. They can be darker, but most of them are very light-colored bulls. Um, another reason that this particular bull was special was because of its size. And I think Mrs. Gagnon could tell you that probably most of the cattle on her parents' farm were about maybe 2,000 pounds, maybe 2,500. But this particular bull weighed 3,300 pounds. Now, I had to look up um, yesterday that my car, which seats five people and is out in the parking lot, weighs 3,100 pounds, the whole car. So this bull weighed 200 pounds more than that. In fact, this isn't the biggest Charolai on Earth. In fact, the third biggest bull of any type on Earth is a Charolai bull from Britain called a Burnsford, a Burnsford Ferry. I brought a picture of him, too. He is seven feet tall and now weighs 4,000 pounds. That's two tons. So they do get very large, even though this one was only 3,300 pounds. Now, another thing that I learned when I researched about cattle is that cattle, like people, when they get together in groups, have leaders. And actually, the leaders, they have different leaders for different situations. So for example, sometimes there's a cow that's a leader um, to help the cattle go in and out of the barn. And sometimes there's a leader for when the cattle have arguments. And they do have arguments, they quarrel, just like people, and some cattle are good at kind of leading out and calming everybody down. And there are another, other types of cows that are leaders when they're out grazing in the field, because as you probably know, cattle are herbivores, they're plant eaters. With four stomachs, they have to have a lot of plant material every day to eat. Um, so, and another thing is that the leaders, the cows that are leaders are not the biggest cows, they're the smartest cows. So on Mr. Mottram's farm, he actually was a, a, loved his cows, and he had names for all of them, and he did have a favorite cow. Her name was Daisy, and she just happened to be the leader when they went out to the field. And because of that, she became what is called a bell cow. You may realize, or maybe not, that some cows, the farmers put bells on their necks. And that way, if the bell is ringing, then in the cow that's the leader has the bell on its neck, the other cows, it makes it easier for them to follow the leader cow. So on this particular day, um, Mr. Mottram looked at his watch. It was about noontime, and he decided that he was going to go out to the field where all of his cattle were grazing that day and bring some medicine to one of the calves that was sick. So he jumped on his little motorbike uh, and went through the fields and uh, gave the calf its medicine. And he decided, well, he had something else to do. Farmers are always busy, of course. So he jumped back on his motorbike and he started to uh, leave the field. 
All of a sudden, bam, he was hit from behind. In fact, he was hit so hard that his body flew 40 feet through the air. That's probably the length of the sanctuary. Not only that, his motorbike also went sailing through the air and hit the gate so hard that it later took three men together their strength to pull it out of the gate. Well, Mr. Mottram ended up wham, laying on the ground on his back, and he realized what had happened. The bull had come up behind him without him knowing it and, and hit him. And while he lay there completely helpless on the ground, the bull charged over to him and started stomping on his body with his big hooves, all 3,300 pounds of him. The bull smashed into his jaw, smashed into his shoulders, his chest, smashed the bones in, in his right leg. And the last thing that he remembered before he passed out was that this thought that he would never see his wife and his children again. Well, sometime later, he opened his eyes and he realized that he was still alive. And he managed to look at his watch, which was about the only thing that wasn't broken. And he noticed that he knew he left the, the barnyard at 12 noon, and now it was 1.30. And there was also something else that he noticed that was very strange. In fact, afterwards he said that in all his years of being a farmer, he had never seen or even heard of such a thing. When he looked up, he realized he was surrounded by his cows. In fact, Daisy leaned down when she saw him open his eyes and sniffed at him. See, what had happened was, he, don't, he, he will never know whether or not he made a noise when the bull was charging and attacking him, but Daisy knew. She saw what was going on, and because she was the leader, she either walked or ran over to him, and because she was the leader, all of the other cows followed her, and they made a circle around Mr. Mottram. And they, it was a very tight circle. And the reason he knew this is because he could still see and hear the bull stomping and snorting and bashing against the cows. It was so angry, it was still trying to hurt him. In fact, it kept bashing against the cows so much that three of the cows were really badly hurt, as he found out later. Um, but they protected him. He had nowhere to go, and he realized there was no one there to help him. So he managed to kind of get himself up on one knee and one elbow, and he realized that he had to get out of the field. The danger still existed. So he managed to crawl towards the edge of the field, and as he did so, all of the circle of cows still stayed around him. So they continued to protect him from that big Charolai bull. He managed to scoot under somehow the hedge uh, that was at the edge of the field. And the, even though he didn't remember how he did it, he managed to crawl across two other fields until he got to the barnyard. But then he had another problem. Um, he had to find a telephone. So he managed to crawl to a telephone. And he picked it up and he called 999, because that's the emergency number in Wales, in Britain actually. But when he, uh, the operator answered the phone the, from the emergency services, she couldn't understand what he was saying because his jaw was broken. He couldn't make the words come out the way they should. So he hung up the phone and he picked it up again and he dialed his neighbor. And because his neighbor next door knew the sound of his voice, he knew something was wrong and he was able to call an ambulance. They took Mr. Mottram to the hospital, and he spent three days in intensive care, and then another full week in the hospital after that. Uh, the bull had broken his, uh, broken his jaw, his shoulder, um, because it stamped on his heart. It broke all the ribs in the front of his body, and of course, that leg. And after his bones healed, um, it was miraculous. He was able to continue his work as a farmer. But it did take all the men weeks to catch the bull. Uh, they had to finally chase him into a truck, and they drove him back to his owner. And guess who is still his favorite cow? Daisy. 
He never forgot that she, she and the others saved his life. And actually, she lived on the farm and she'll de until she died at a ripe old age of 34, which is actually very old for cattle. Even in the wild they, and, and on the farm, sometimes they only live 15 to 20 years, sometimes a lot less. Now, when I, I think it's an amazing story, absolutely amazing. But when I think about the Bible, there was one verse that really popped out and made me think when I thought of this particular story. It's actually in the book of Psalms, uh, chapter 34, number 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. So I guess sometimes angels come in furry coats and floppy ears and big brown eyes. <laughs> let's uh, Lord, let's uh, bow our heads for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for loving us, and we thank you for giving us the gift of eternal life, and we also thank you for protecting us from evil as we wait for your soon return. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. Just want to thank Jennifer for such a good story and we are now going to take this moment to pray Jesus is asking us today what do you want me to do for you prayer is a wonderful opportunity to connect with Jesus and we need to pray for each other we need to pray for a church a pastor we need to pray for our children and for those babies that will be born soon. Uh, let's take this moment to kneel and join me as we pray. Dear Father, this uh, Sabbath morning, we come into your house to worship you. We are happy that we have a God who is our Father, who knows all our circumstances and our situation, and we bring them to you this day. But before we go forth, we want to uplift your name and praise you for your compassion, for your mercies, for your kindness, for your tolerance. We want to thank you, Lord, that you have gifted us with the greatest gift that we could ever receive, and that's your Son. And we ask this Sabbath morning that you will join us today as we worship you, and that our worship will not be in vain, but our worship will be sincere. I ask, Lord, that you would remember this church, and that you will give us the strength and the consistency and the courage to represent you in this community. I pray, Lord, that you will be with all the families of this church, that you will take good care of them and watch over them and those that are sick. I ask that you will be a comfort to them and to heal them and to bring them through their sickness. I pray for the use of this church and those who are graduated, graduating and those who have graduated. I pray that you will keep them safe and that you will remember them when you return and that they will have a place in your kingdom. Lord, I pray for the um, elderly among us. I pray that you'll take good care of them and that you will watch over them. And I know that you would never forsake them. And I pray that as members of this church, we'll keep our eyes open to see uh, uh, situations where we could be of help to our elderly and to those who are sick. Father, um, I pray for your work across uh, Southern New England and across America. I pray that your name will be uplifted and be remembered and that great things will be accomplished through your people. I pray for the people in Ukraine and the horrible uh, situation that they have gotten themselves into because of uh, e the evil of war. And I ask that you will bring it an end soon and that you will restore people to their homes and that you will end this horrible, horrible situation that has descended upon Ukraine. Father, across the globe, there are people who are suffering in Haiti and 
Africa and Asia, far do you know that sin has really brought so much evil and sadness and sickness. And I pray, Lord, that you will minister to those who are suffering and hurting and that you will let them know that the Prince of Peace is available to bring peace to their lives. Finally, today, Lord, I ask that you will be with the message that will present today, and I hope, pray that everyone will receive a blessing, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. by our sister Paula Gibbons. Thank you, Paula, for that musical selection. Good morning, church. Our scripture reading today will be taken from the book of Mark, chapter 11, verses 12 to 17. And I'll be reading from the New International Virgin. The next days, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seen in the distance a fig tree, in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say, it. on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned tables of money changers and benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, it is not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. May the Lord add his blessings unto the reading of his word. Thank you, Kabil, for that reading. I just want to welcome all of you that are here today. I would like you to know how pleased and happy I am to see you. And Kibel, we are so happy to see you and your family. Your kids have grown up looking so handsome and beautiful. 
Uh, it's amazing how time goes by and how these children grow. Let's continue to pray for our children, that God will keep them safe and that they will remain loyal to him. Because when we are gone, we would like to know that our children uh, continue with the message of Jesus Christ to the world. Uh, the message today is entitled, Nothing But Leaves. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning we are here to hear from you. I recognize, Lord, that I am flawed and imperfect. Therefore, I need your help and your assistance to help me to present your truth. I pray that everyone here today will be blessed and will leave knowing that they serve a God who is loving and kind and merciful is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Kibble just read the scripture reading, and I want to continue to verse 20. I just want to read just verse 20 before I begin. Jesus had seen this fig tree that was full of leaves, and he cursed it. And verse 20 says, In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Jesus does not go around cursing anybody or anything. But yet for all, we are astonished at Jesus, who is full of love, who is full of kindness, cursing what we will say a harmless tree. And one has to ask the question, why did Jesus do that? Why did Jesus curse a fig tree? And we also have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be cursed by Jesus Christ. We need to define the word curse in context of the Bible, and we need to understand that a curse is not something that is permanent. God will always reverse a curse. To understand the word curse, we need to look at the opposite, which is a blessing. The Bible is full of blessings. Actually, the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus went to preach, he mentioned these Beatitudes, which are called blessing. Blessed are the, the peacemaker. Blessed are the pure in heart. And he's blessing. And he's blessing. So what is a blessing? A blessing is really God's approval. God's presence in something. So that's why we call the Sabbath a blessed day, because it's, it has God's presence. Marriage is blessed by God, because he's the one that... His presence there. So when we talk about a curse, we're talking about something that does not have God's blessing. If we don't have God's blessing in our lives and in our church, we will die spiritually. Isn't that true? If God curses something, he's withdrawing his blessings. He is saying that I no longer can participate in this lifestyle. I can no longer participate in this movement or this organization because I am not the one that is the leader or the, 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 the founder of this organization. When Jesus removes himself from something, it is cursed. So what was happening here? For three years, Jesus came to the Jewish nation and he was presenting himself as their savior, their Messiah. For three years, Jesus healed the sick. For three years, Jesus cast out demons. For three years, Jesus cleansed lepers. And one week before he died, he did the most amazing thing. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. 
If you read the book of John, you'd notice that that precipitated the crucifixion of Jesus. When Lazarus was raised from the dead, it says that the Jews went to their leaders and reported what Jesus did. And if you read what the leaders said, they said, listen, if we don't stop this guy now, we are going to lose our temple. They had put the church and the temple before Jesus Christ. So Jesus now, one week before his crucifixion, went back to Jerusalem. The Bible says in the book of Mark that after the Palm Sunday, that's the day he went into Jerusalem with the donkey, riding a donkey, everybody was shouting, Hosanna, save the, the son of David. He went into the temple and he looked around. And what he saw he didn't like, but he didn't deal with it right off the bat. Jesus decided the next day I'm going to deal with this situation. On his way to the temple, Jesus, you could see his humanity, saw a fig tree that was in bloom. Whenever you see leaves on a fig tree, you should have figs. Jesus was hungry. And in the distance, he could see this tree in bloom, and he felt, that it's humanity, that figs must be there. And as he got to the tree, to his amazement, no. No figs. The tree was a pretender. What good is a beautiful house that has no electricity? What good is a Mercedes Benz without engine? What good is a human being without literally a brain? And I mean that. I, I, you know, in one of my psychology courses, we were doing um, the brain. It's a rare situation, but uh, I, I guess it, it was during the time when probably ultrasounds weren't available, but a couple brought home a wonderful baby. But the baby would not stop crying. The baby had everything. The baby would not stop crying. And they took the baby back to the hospital, and after many tests, they found that the baby only had a brain stem. There was no brain. It was a sad, sad situation. The baby had eyes but couldn't see. Ears but couldn't hear. No brain was, all it had a brain stem, and the brain stem is that part of the brain that controls vital life function. So the child was able to um, breathe because you have the medulla oblongata there. The child was able to reflectively suck in the milk, but after a while, the child passed. What Jesus was saying to the Jewish people today, you have a wonderful temple and a very elaborate service, but God is not there. God is not present. And when he cursed the tree, he was saying that there are two types of worship, spiritual worship and ritualistic worship. Spiritual worship cared about people. Spiritual worship was concerned about how people act and react, and spiritual worship was very interpersonal. Traditional worship promoted rules and regulations. They were more obsessed about their rules and their regulation. 
So when Jesus went into the temple, he was really acting out. The, the parable of the fig tree was really an acted out parable. So when he went in the temple, he cleared the temple. Now what does that mean? It meant that the area where the, the Gentiles should be. You see, the temple was divided between the Jews and the non-Jews, or the Gentiles. It was during the Passover, so you had like over two million people in Jerusalem. The Gentiles also came to worship God. The leaders of the Jewish nation cleared out the temple, the area where the Gentiles should be. So the Gentiles had no place to worship, and they brought their cattle there, and they brought the money changers. You see, these foreigners, when they come into Jerusalem, had to change their currency into the temple shekel. So you had money changers sitting there in the Gentiles' quarter, and when the people came to buy their animals, they will say, you can't use that foreign corn, currency, you have to use the temple currency, so you had people who were doing the exchange. Plus, and most of them were Sadducees. Actually, history has shown that Ananias, Ananas, or Ananias, who was the, the, the uh, I think it was the stepfather, not the stepfather, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, was, a, was in charge of the money changers. So you had the money changers being controlled by the Sadducees, and the Pharisees were the ones who were making certain that the lamb and the doves were perfect. So what these guys used to do, they used to have an area where all the sheep and the turtle dove were situated, and when people bring their sheep and their animal, they will say, no, yours are not perfect. You take those perfect, those perfect animals over here. And they were getting a cut for that. And Jesus saw what was happening in the temple. And he cleaned that out. And he says, listen, my house is a house for prayer. You see, Jesus saw worship very differently from the Jews. The Jews looked at the temple primarily as a place of sacrifice. But Jesus saw it as a place of prayer. What that means is this. That worship that is Christ-centered or God-centered will be worship that will change people from within. Worship that is outward and full of rules Worship that is dead and lifeless. You know, Christians must offer the world something. The world is hungry. The world is hungry for something, and we know that something is really somebody. When they come to church, they're looking for that somebody. But all they see in many churches is nothing but leaves. They see malice. They see resentment. They see politics, pride, but they don't see Jesus. Nothing but leaves. You see, what good is it for a restaurant? to advertise delicious American Caribbean breakfast and lunch. And when you get in there, it's a hardware store. Whatever we advertise to people, they expect to see Jesus. The Jewish nation was full of ceremonial and services and ritualistic services. And what has happened over a period of time is that the power of God was missing. All they had was ceremonies. I ask the question today. When people come to visit our churches, 
And after, you have to remember that it's more than a building. Our lives are mobile churches. When people come in touch with us, do they see Jesus in us? We have to remember that rituals cannot heal the sick. Rituals cannot raise the dead. Rituals cannot cast out demons. Rituals cannot give peace. Rituals cannot save. Who can save? Jesus. A fig tree with leaves is a sign that it has fruit. But since it had no fruit, Jesus cursed it to teach us a fundamental lesson about appearances that don't match reality. A fig tree is a symbol of the nation of Israel. And instead of presenting Jesus, they present a ritualistic religion that did not meet the souls of people. Spiritual worship is about a person. It's about a God who can save, about a God who can bring healing. Spiritual worship reminds us that God cares for us. And by the way we interact and with others, it shows what God is like. You know, there's a book that was written many, 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 many years ago by an Adventist um, psychologist. It is entitled, um, Why Teenagers Reject Religion and What to Do About It. And in the book, the author, Roger Dudley, said that the rejection of religion by teenagers and the youth often is related to harsh, rigid, autocratic ways in which parents and teachers attempt to force religious values on their youth. It also says that the, 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 these young people look at the lives of their elders and who put high stock in religion and have decided that they do not want to be like their older generation. If you are so religious that you are mean, <laughs> that you have no empathy, why should the young people follow that religion? And that's what was happening in Jewish days. These people were so eager for the Sabbath to come that they wanted Jesus to die before the Sabbath. That's, what's, that's what happened when religion is devoid of God and Jesus Christ. They were saying, we want to make certain that he dies before the Sabbath, so you got to break his legs. And that's what they were doing. They went around breaking people's legs so they can die before the Sabbath, so they don't have to bury people during the Sabbath. They want to hurry up the crucifixion so that they can get back and keep the Sabbath. They made the Sabbath a God. God says that man is greater than the Sabbath. I don't know if you're aware of that. Man is greater than the Sabbath. Some people will tell you, listen, I can't help you because it's Sabbath. They are so much into keeping the Sabbath that they would not do good to people. That's what the Jews were all about. And today, the Bible is saying that the church of Laodicean can be like that. When Jesus is the center of our lives, the Sabbath has a rightful place. If mankind is hurting and suffering on the Sabbath, and you have to drive your car and put gas in your car and go to the gas station to, to put gas in your car to pick up somebody, do it. Some people say, no, I can't buy gas in the Sabbath. Can't do it. It's the Sabbath. These are situations that have led to leaves but no fruit. The message seems to be a harsh message. But we know that Jesus 
never, never leaves us hopeless. There is good news. You know, in the, the book of education, page 294, Ellen White, as we know, a prolific author, said this, the divine teacher bears with the errand. He waits to welcome again and again the errand. The rebellious, even the apostate, though all are precious in his sight, the rough, sullen, stubborn dispositions draw more heavily upon his sympathy and love. Jesus loves the rebellious. He loves those who do not always fit in our way of living. Jesus is saying, Yes, you have done something bad. And I'm going to curse this tree, which represents that I am going to bring judgment on this nation. But that was not something permanent. You know how I know that? Because about 50 days after that, Peter was preaching. That the same nation that... God was talking so negatively about, Peter was preaching, and he says, listen, you see that Jesus that you, that, that you crucify was your Messiah? And the Bible says it pricked them to the heart. And they said, men and brethren, what should we do? And Peter says, repent. And 3,000 give their hearts to the Lord. The message for us today is that if we repent, God will relent. God never takes, puts judgment that's on, on a person and says forever and ever, you are cursed. No longer would you have my presence. If we repent, all of us have to look within our lives and ask ourselves, have we truly represented Jesus in the church, in the home, in our personal lives? And all of us, including myself, will have to say that we have failed. But by repenting, what does God do? God takes away all of that negative judgment and brings a blessing. You know, I want to conclude by giving you two amazing examples of how God can reverse the curse. I am not sure if you're aware of this, but one of the most despicable and evil men that you can find in the Bible is found in the book of Kings, and his name is Ahab. Have you heard of Ahab? Ahab married um, Jezebel, who was uh, from um, Sidon, and they imposed Baal worship upon Israel. He was such, and she was such a wicked person, that one day... He looked through his window and he saw a beautiful vineyard. He says, listen, I want that vineyard. Somebody says, no, that belongs to Naboth. You can't have it. Well, he went home and he went in his bed like a spoiled child and he wouldn't come out. His wife came home and says, what's the matter with you? He says, I want Naboth vineyard and I can't get it. He says, you want that vineyard and you can't, you can't take it? You are king. I am going to find a way to, for you to get it. So she made up a, uh, a charge that neighbor blasphemed God's name and he was stoned to death. And she says, now you can go and have it. This is a wicked man. He deserved God's judgment. But look what God did. I want to show you something. God did something amazing. Let's find 1 Kings 
chapter 21. 1 Kings chapter 21. And we are going to see something here that is simply amazing. 1 Kings chapter 21. Now God sent Elijah to confront him. And let's read verse um, 32. Actually, 23. Let's begin with 23. So Elijah the prophet went to Ahab now and says, I know what you have done. God has shown me what you have done. And there's a lot of course now, a lot of judgment that is being pronounced on Ahab and on Jezebel. So let's begin with verse 20. 1 Kings 21, 20. Ahab said to Elijah, So you have found me, my enemy. I have found you, he answered, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. I am going to bring disaster on you. Now, it, Elijah is talking for God. I will consume your descendants and cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel. Slave or free, I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, and of Basha, the son of Eadja, because they have provoked me to anger and have caused Israel to sin. And also concerning Jezebel, your wife, the Lord says, dog will devour Jezebel by the walls of Jezreel. This is judgment. This is what we call him when, of course. But this is horrible. Dogs will eat those belonging to Ahab who died in the city, and the birds of the air will feed on those who die in the country. They will, and then verse 25 says, There was never a man like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord and urged on by his wife Jezebel. He, he behaved, verse 26, he behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols like the Amorites uh, that the Lord drove out before Israel. Now look at verse 27 and 28. We had judgment, just judgment on these people. When Heab heard these words, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. Look what the Lord did in 29, 28. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Who would have thought that this wicked guy, God will be pronouncing something positive? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. Listen, the message that God has for us today is we got to do better as Christians. We have to let the world see Jesus in us. It's amazing what's happening to the Christian church, including Adventist church. When I say the Christian church, I'm talking about all Protestant church, including our church. There is so much riff and fighting and politics in the church today that people can't see Jesus. All they see are leaves. You know what are those leaves? Beautiful singing. Wonderful edifice. Great choirs. Great praise teams. And by the time they leave, no Jesus. When somebody comes in touch in, with your life, they must not hear from your mouth politics spewing politics about who to vote for, who not to vote for. Tell them to vote for Jesus Christ. Tell them to put Jesus in their lives. Amen. When the church makes Jesus the center, it will be a church that will be like a house with electricity. A human with brains. A Mercedes Benz with an engine. What The reasons why church is dying, these churches are dying across the globe is because they're lifting up ritualistic worship 
and Jesus is not present. How many times you come to church today and you don't hear a message about Jesus? It's more the promotion of man. And I am saying today that Jesus is saying, repent. We need to turn away from ritualistic worship. The last example I want to show you is about another king. I think he was worse than Ahab in a way because he, he was from the tribe of Judah. Ahab was on the northern, was the northern kingdom. His father was a great king. His father was Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a very good king, but Hezekiah had a son named Manasseh who ruled for 55 years. And he engaged in idolatry and even passed his kids through the fire. This is what Manasseh did. For 55 years, he led Israel into idolatry. But look at what happened later on in his life. Let's turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 10. Let's turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 10. And we are going to look at verse 16. 2 Chronicles chapter 10 and verse 16. Let's see if that's, or maybe it's, let's see if it's First Chronicles. I have Second Chronicles 10, 16 in my notes, but let's see if it's, okay. Okay, let's see, it's here. Okay, I, I think I have the wrong um, text here, but I, I just want to share with you that Manasseh in his later days turned back to the Lord and the Lord forgave Manasseh for his wicked ways. And the Bible says that Manasseh ended up dying an old age with the blessings of God. I'm saying today that when Jesus cursed that tree, he was actually talking about ritualistic religion that offers no meaning, no peace, no joy to people. He tells us today, like a Jewish nation, that he is here to provide us with power to change people's lives. First, he will change our lives, and once he changes our lives, we can bring people to Jesus Christ. So this tree that was cursed represented the nation that refused to allow Jesus to be the center of their lives. What about us today? Do we have the electricity of the Holy Spirit? The song says, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. All is wonderful passion and purity. O thou spirit divine, all my nature refined till the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. I hope today that as we go through our days, that the beauty of Jesus will be seen. The leaves, yes, should attract you to the fruit, which is Jesus. We should live such wonderful lives that people will want to know who is it that has led you to live such a good life. You know, you have a $100 bill, all right? And you're going to go and buy something at the store. And you bought a lot of grocery and it came up to about $100. So when it's time for you to pay, you give that $100 bill to the clerk. And the person looks at it, you know, they have to check it out. They look at it and they say, Oh, this is a counterfeit. This is useless. He says, but it looks like a real $100 bill. But the guy says, it's a counterfeit. He says, 
but can you not at least give me $10 worth of grocery? He says, no, this bill is a counterfeit and it's useless. The message today is that no matter how wonderful our worship is, it's in vain if Jesus is not the center of it. Counterfeit worship is as useless as no worship. When we come to church, Jesus must be the center of our preaching. Jesus must be the center of our teaching. Young people do not leave the church because of doctrines. You never hear them say, you know something? I can't put up with the sanctuary message. I cannot put up with the Sabbath. They leave because they look for Jesus and they find Satan in some of us. I'm sorry to say that. They look for Jesus in the home and they see people who talk a lot about religion but there's no love in their heart. They look for Jesus in our elementary schools, in our secondary schools, and all they see, rules, rules, rules. That type of religion is dead and cannot bring people to Jesus Christ. The message is that it is not too late for us to bring Jesus back. What a wonderful thing it will be in my life and your life if when people look and they see us, they see Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, today we recognize that we need you. That even though we may falter here and falter there, we are glad that you, have a, you are a God that gives us a second chance. That you are calling us to repent. You're calling us to return to you. For we know in the book of Revelation, it says that you are outside, knocking to come in. And we pray, Lord, that we'll open the door to let you in. And when you come in, Lord, you said you want to have fellowship. We invite you into our hearts and into our church today. And I thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to turn around and to repent and to start all over again is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand as we sing our closing hymn. Number 631, I think, or 625. 625. 625. I 
want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and I shall stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plain than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Heavenly Father, indeed, our prayer is that you plant our feet on solid ground. We recognize, Lord, that in you there's the answer for all of our problems. In you there's the solution for all of our distresses. And we ask you, Lord, to come into our hearts and take up your rightful place. We ask that you will come in and manage us, manage our emotions, manage our desires, give us new appetites, give us new desires, and make us, O oh Lord, like Jesus, so that others will be attracted to you and will know that you are a God that cares and love and is coming back soon. And I pray that all of us here today will be ready for that glorious day, for the day it will be when you return and bring an end to war and suffering and pain and pandemic. We know this is going to happen soon, and we pray that we will be all ready for that glorious day. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.